Testing, testing, hello? Hello. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Christian Wagesbeck. I'm the curator of 20th Century Art here at the New Mexico Museum of Art. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our lecture today. How many of you have been to a program here in our St. Francis Auditorium before? Oh, that's what I like to see. Great. And I mean, really, there's no better place to hear a lecture about Pueblo Revival architecture than here, right? So before we get started, I'd like to ask uh, if anybody has cell phones or beepers or any little doodad noisemakers, if you could please turn those off. We'd all be very appreciative. And I'd like to start by just making a few opening remarks and then I'll hand it over. Um, the New Mexico Museum of Art is working in partnership with the School for Advanced Research to present a series of public presentations to honor our shared history. As I'm sure many of you know, this year marks the centennial celebration of the New Mexico Museum of Art. Last year marked SAR's 110th anniversary, and this year is the 40th anniversary of the Indian Arts Research Center at SAR. These presentations are supported by the New Mexico Humanities Council, whose mission is to enhance the civic and cultural life of the citizens of New Mexico. However, any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment of the Humanities or the New Mexico Humanities Council. I know, right? <laughs> And I'd just also like to say that these programs all relate to the centennial exhibition here at the New Mexico Museum of Art Horizons, People in Place in New Mexican Art, um, and focus on shared aspects of Native American art and architecture as seen at both the museum here and at SAR. And I would like to invite any, anyone who has not seen the exhibition to please go and visit it um, after this lecture. And those of you who have seen it may be interested to know that just last Friday, we were able to introduce six new Pueblo paintings, uh, two new textiles, and a brand new Pueblo pot. So there's new things to be seen, even if you've been there already. So please go check it out. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Nancy Owen Lewis, project director and scholar in residence at the School for Advanced Research, who will introduce today's speaker, Christine Mather. Dr. Lewis is former director of the scholar program at SAR and the author of A Peculiar Alchemy, A Centennial History of SAR, and Chasing the Cure in New Mexico, Tuberculosis and the Quest for Health. She also contributed to an article um, to the New Mexico Museum of Art Centennial series titled They Came to Heal, They Stayed to Paint, The Artists, Their Boss, and the Gallery, which appeared in this spring's 2018 issue of El Palacio. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Owen Lewis. Thank you uh, for that introduction. I am very pleased to introduce our speaker, Christine Mather, whose lecture is actually the third in a series on Santa Fe's colorful legacy, which as Christian just mentioned, is hosted by the New Mexico Museum of Art, the School for Advanced Research, and also in partnership with the historic Santa Fe Foundation. And I want to begin by mentioning that we have two more events scheduled in this, in this series. On September 23rd, Brian Vio, director of SAR's Indian Arts Research Center, will share a, chair a panel on Pueblo textiles and embroideries featuring artists Ramona Sakiestua, Isabel Gonzalez, and Louis Garcia. And the series concludes October 7th with a historic artist home tour sponsored by the historic Santa Fe Foundation. So please mark your calendars for those events. In developing this program, we decided to include a presentation on Pueblo Revival architecture because not only is it an important part of our artistic heritage, but given the fact that five of our presentations are here, in the St. Francis Auditorium, we thought it important to examine how this style developed and ultimately employed in the design of this iconic building. And we immediately thought of Christine Mather as the ideal person to present this lecture, and thankfully she agreed uh, to present it. Um, Christine, who has a BA in anthropology, and an MA in Art History from the University of Michigan, 
is the author of seven books, including four style books, as she calls them, Santa Fe Style, published in 1986, Native America, Arts, Traditions, and Celebrations, 1990, True West, Arts, Traditions, and Celebrations, published in 1992, and Santa Fe Houses, which came out in 2002. And she also contributed an article to the New Mexico Museum of Arts Centennial Series, which appeared in the fall 2016 issue of El Palacio, titled Its Own Beautiful Self Manifesting Santa Fe Style from Dreams, Diagrams, and Dust. The article focuses on the development of Santa Fe style as manifested in what was then the new art museum. In addition to being a writer, she has a long distinguished, but as I understand it, somewhat underground career as a curator. Because as she explained to me, I spent years locked up in Santa Fe basements. <laughs> First as curator of the Spanish colonial art at the museum, uh, Spanish colonial art at the Museum of International Folk Art, that's from 1975 to 84, and later as curator of collections at the New Mexico Museum of Art, 2002 through 2011. And in 2013, in recognition of her exemplary leadership and service to our museums here in New Mexico, the New Mexico Association of Museums presented her with the Edgar Hewitt Award. She currently serves as consulting curator at El Rancho de las Golondrinas. So please join me in welcoming Christine Mather. I was telling Nancy that it, this may be my swan song because it's getting kind of challenging between the glasses, not these glasses, these glasses, the technology, and the memory. It's all starting to go south. So, but I know that you all will hang in there with me. Thank you. Uh, this um, talk is really based on an exhibit I did here at the museum. Uh, it was at the museum and then it was also up at the Governor's Gallery as part of the celebration of the 100th anniversary of this building. And uh, at that time I did all this research and, and did the exhibit and it was great and I'm something of a bridge burner so when it was done I um, kind of got rid of all of my notes and everything, thinking I would never be doing this again. So uh, this is a reconstruction here, and I learned a lot of new things by going back and uh, looking at all of my notes and rereading all of the um, text that I had originally uh, uh, used. And uh, at when I first decided to do this lecture, I thought, well, this is a good title, this will work. Uh, but as I went on, it, it seemed somewhat inadequate because Pueblo Revival architecture is not just important to this building, it's important to the entire face of Santa Fe. That um, I came to the conclusion, and I'll talk about this more as we go along, that um, this city would be a very, very different place had this building not been built and had, um, had not a group of uh, foresighted individuals work together to actively change Santa Fe. And that's really what Pueblo Revival style architecture is mostly about, or Santa Fe style architecture. So, I do want to mention that I, I learned from a lot of people <laughs> along the way, and I have stole, stolen freely from their work. And I especially want to draw your attention to an eight part, now it's up to nine part, and it's going to be 10, uh, a centennial series uh, in El Palacio, which you can easily bring up on, um, on the Google machine. So, 
uh, go ahead and do that because there's a lot of information that I won't be able to cover in this, in this hour. And I also want to mention that in my most recent research, I discovered that the San Diego, um, the city of San Diego has an eight part PBS series on building Balboa Park. I mean, who knew? So um, look that up too, because it has a lot of vintage photography that really, um, um, that experience shaped our experience, the San Diego experience. So in the end, I came to the conclusion that really this was more uh, dramatic and it's sprawling, this story. It goes all over the place. It affects every part of, of our history, our contemporary history here in Santa Fe. So, uh, and it's, it's epic. And it involves some really interesting people and let's, let's talk a little bit about those folks. But first I wanna talk about the nature of this concept of Pueblo revival. Um, I found amongst my, that big pile of papers um, a, a sheet that described what Santa Fe style is. And I think this must have been done by David Rausch. It, it had his name all over it, but not, but not on it. Um, and he's the head of the Historic Preservation Division for the city of Santa Fe. And so he was tr trying to define for people all of these many different names of, of styles of architecture here in, in Santa Fe. Number one, we have Santa Fe style, and we, and it's so, just trips off the tongue and we love that, so we hang on to that one. But it includes Pueblo Spanish Revival or Spanish Pueblo Revival or Pueblo Revival. So we're just gonna call it Pueblo Revival for the sake of simplicity. And it also, it, Santa Fe style also includes territorial revival and Santa Fe vernacular. And then we have all this other whole list of things, mission revival, Spanish colonial revival, Moorish revival. There are examples of all of these things in Santa Fe and, and we'll talk a little bit about them. And then uh, rural territorial, really important. Uh, regional modernism, we're coming up to today and sustainable Pueblo style. That's why I know it's David Rapp, because he's, he's into that. So um, you see a photograph here that was taken probably around 1912 by Carlos Vieira. And Carlos Vieira is considered to be the first artist to move and, and to be in Santa Fe. And he came because of tuberculosis um, to recover. And fortunately for us all, he did recover. And he uh, took this photograph, and we see what Santa Fe, parts of Santa Fe look like in 1912 or so, we think. That's when these photos uh, date from. So um, at that point, it wasn't the city beautiful or the city different, it was the city sluggish. It was really in a bad way. And uh, it was up to a number of individuals uh, who decided that they were going to change that, and they went for it. Um, the first among them was Edgar Lee Hewitt, and uh, if you are not from Santa Fe or from New Mexico, are, are there any out-of-towners here? Good. Nice to see you. I just want you to know, if you want to be like a, a native, you have to know everybody's middle name. Our cultural icons, you know, it's Edgar Lee Hewitt, it's always John Gall meme, it's never John meme, and, and then you will fit right in, so welcome. Uh, now, Edgar Lee Hewitt was, it, what he accomplished in a lifetime, and especially in these first four or five years of, of um, or 10 years of, of running these institutions, uh, was kind of staggering it makes you kind of weak at the knees to think of all the roles that he played. He was the, pres the first president of New Mexico Normal, which is now Highlands. He uh, was appointed the director of the School of American Archaeology in 1907, and that became SAR uh, in 1917. He was the founding director of the Museum of New Mexico in 1909. He was appointed the director of exhibits in 1915 for the Panama, California Exposition, of which we'll talk more, and that was in San Diego. And meanwhile, he was asked to serve on a group appointed by Mayor Arthur Seligman in 1912 
for the planning for the city of Santa Fe. So he held this dual directorship of the museums of New Mexico and SAR until his death. And you see when his death is, 1946. So he was there for a long time. And in a way, he kind of wore out his welcome um, with a lot of the people who had to work with him. I think it was difficult. His nickname was El Toro. <laughs> which suggests to me that he was a bit of a bully, perhaps. And, um, but he was also, he was the rainmaker par excellence. He just could put things together. He put money and people together. And I think his strongest suit was that he was a, uh, a real judge of character. He picked some wonderful people to help him in his pursuits. Now, one of the people who really helped him was Frank Springer, and he's the, the tall man in the other photograph. Um, and he uh, was a philanthropist. I think that would be the best way to describe him. He came to New Mexico in 1873. He was a president of the Normal School, regent for the Museum of New Mexico, on the board of the School of American Archaeology, and he was the t attorney for the Maxwell Land Grant, which I assume is where the money came from. And so between Hewitt and, and Springer, Springer uh, bankrolled a lot of what we, we are sitting in today. He paid for half of the construction of this building, and then some. Um, and as Jess Nussbaum, another person we'll talk a little bit about, said, Dr. Springer personally employed Carlos Vieira to make photographs and paintings of all the surviving early Franciscan missions. So the other man in the photograph, the shorter uh, man, is Carlos Vieira. And so he, Springer was really instrumental in, in helping Carlos Vieira's career and um, also supporting him. Other people that we don't want to forget are Jess Nussbaum, who um, was the construction, head of construction here at the museum, and he was hired by, by, Vier, by, excuse me, by Hewitt, as was Kenneth Chapman, the, the, the dignified-looking seated man, who I think looks like the young Abe Lincoln, don't you? He's just so handsome. Um, Kenneth Chapman, I think, has not been given his due, um, and unfortunately, in this lecture, I won't be able to do it either. But um, he's somebody that we should know a little bit more about, and he was an archaeologist and an artist. And uh, by the way, Jess Nussbaum, whose photo you see uh, in the first photo, became the, f the, um, the first archaeologist hired by the National Park Service. He ran Mesa Verde. He ran the, the he ran everything too. He he ran. Um, he was hired by Hewitt, and he supervised the restoration of the New Mexico Palace uh, of the Governors in 1913. And this is a, a really significant um, fact. And then he continued on to be the director of the Laboratory of Anthropology until 1935. And then he also had dual roles at Mesa Verde and the Laboratory of Anthropology. Um, really an important person to Santa Fe, and I will be quoting from, from him. And last, but certainly not least, is Harrison Ford. <laughs> I, is Sylvanus Griswold Morley. Notice this, the middle name, Griswold, okay? And he was an extraordinary person. He was a Mayan scholar. And it's very clear who Indiana Jones was channeling. Uh, because the, he's a dead ringer. I mean, even the beard thing is going on. So it's really pretty amazing. Um, and I'm going to quote Jess Nussbaum about Morley, uh, Sylvanus Morley, when, at the time of his death. Uh, and he, he uh, quotes. Well, let me just quote this. In January, quote, January 1915 issue of Old Santa Fe, which was a magazine, will always remain a cherished document for those 
who have in any manner shared or benefited from what he did, he being Morley, did to preserve and perpetuate our Pueblo and Spanish traditions in architecture and the old Santa Fe atmosphere. So Morley, who was really a Mayan scholar, got deeply involved uh, with the creation of Santa Fe and Santa Fe style. In fact, he is credited with uh, coming up with that term, Santa Fe style, that he is. And he was also appointed the director of, school, of the School of American Research and the Museum of New Mexico when Hewitt finally died in, in 1946. But he only lived another two years. Now, just to back up a little bit, before all of this creation was going on in Santa Fe, there were other things happening in the state, and it actually never gets mentioned in any of the writings from any of the authors in Santa Fe, which is really kind of interesting, that they don't mention what was happening at the University of New Mexico, even though some of them taught down there. Um, but one thing that was really crucial is that there was a president of the university, William G. Tite, who was, quote, absorbed with the prospect of breaking away from the commonplace. And so he, um, in 1908, took this Romanesque revival-style building and uh, chopped part of the top of it off and turned it into a Pueblo-style building, 1908. Uh, and it's considered some people consider the fact that he did this as his death knell because he was then fired from the university. <laughs> and the other thing that it's important to think about the University of New Mexico as well because of John Gaumin, who uh, his firm from 1933 to 1958 uh, designed and supervised the construction of all of the university of New Mexico's buildings. Um, here it says 18, I have another quote that says 40 buildings. Uh, and this will be, uh, hopefully it will become obvious to you why I'm bringing this up later. And then there were other things going on in Santa Fe. There were other revival style buildings experimentally being made. Um, and to quote Morley from that 1915 document, Still, another kind of building to which the Santa Fe style has been successful is the sanatorium. So that's Sun Mount up there, and that building still exists, as well as the warehouse of the Gross Kelly Company, um, which Morley, call, quote, to quote him, is nothing more than a Santa Fe style church and a warehouse. So these experiments were being made. In fact, both of these buildings were designed by a firm uh, of Isaac and William Rapp, uh, along with their uh, other employee, A.C. Hendrickson. And uh, here's another example of their work. And this is a building done in 1912 in Trinidad, Colorado, which is where they were their home base at that time. And you can see it's a handsome building. It could be in Texas. It could be, you know, in any place in Illinois. Um, they were the big guns for hire. If you wanted a beautiful building, you went to Rap and Rap, and they would give you what you wanted. And um, so that's very important because uh, sometimes there was a book written called um, Creator of the Santa Fe Style about the Rap and Rap company. And I don't believe they were the creators. They were the, um, they were the architects of, of note who, who did the work, but they were guided by, I believe, by two people, Morley and uh, Vieira. And I will try and show you how, why I came to that conclusion. But before that, let me talk about another important aspect that's going on at the same time. Okay, 1912, that building's built in Trinidad. 1912, New Mexico becomes a state, and there, you know, it took them forever to become a state because there were too many Spanish-speaking people here and they were Catholics and, you know, blah, blah, blah. The same problems of today. 
Um, but they finally became a state in 1912, and uh, up to that time, there were two factions, one faction saying, get rid of all this adobe, it's keeping us from becoming a state, we've got to modernize, and the other faction saying, we must preserve this, and this is a big, um, big conflict within the community. In 1912, the uh, mayor of Santa Fe, Arthur Seligman, goes ahead and um, hires or uh, brings on board, not, not hires, a citizen group of plant uh, to do the first city planning for Santa Fe. This is very early for city planning anywhere in the US, let alone uh, west of the Mississippi. And they, I, I, I note up there the dates of this planning commission's, um, the, the date that they were brought on, August, what, no, January, and the date that they complete, completed their report, August. I hope the mayor's in here somewhere. <laughs> because these guys were on fire. I mean, they really got to work on planning how the city should be, and they came up with a, uh, an important document that I think became the basis for our historic preservation ordinance here in Santa Fe. Uh, it took them another 40 years to get there, but it becomes the basis. And there were a couple of things that they um, had in their report. That, well, number, number one, they went to Frederick Law Olmsted, the Central Park guy, and they asked and told him that, that what they wanted to do was to plan a residence and resort city. Well, whoa, did they succeed at that? <laughs> and the report said the preservation of the ancient streets, roads, and structures in and about the city is of the first importance. These monuments of the first Americans should be preserved intact at almost any cost. I mean, that is really the basis of our our historic preservation document today. And they also said, we believe that everything should be done to create a public sentiment so strong that the Santa Fe style will always predominate. But Jess Nussbaum tells us that there was still this issue between those who wish to preserve and perpetuate historic streets and buildings and adapt regional architecture to modern needs and those who wanted to forget past mud, hut, and narrow street traditions and pursue modern trends. That's to quote Net Nussbaum. But Nussbaum also goes on to say the first definitive public swing towards preserving and perpetuating the old traditions followed the completion by me in the late fall of 1913 of the restoration of the old portal on the governor's palace. Um, he called it a restoration. It was a wholesale wipeout. They just took off the old um, um, portal, and, and you can see in this photograph, they built a new one. And what it was based on, we have no idea, but they went ahead, and that was the style that they came up with. Um, and then also the board recommended this is crucial, that no building permits be issued to any person intending to build on any street listed and indicated on the map as ancient until proper assurance is given that the architecture will conform exteriorly with the Santa Fe style. This never became ordinance. This was a recommendation of the board. So at the same time uh, that the, this board is working away on convincing people that they needed to have a preservation aspect to the city of Santa Fe, that they should be saving the streets, they're renaming the streets, uh, preserving all of the special buildings in the community. At that same time, they also began to realize that they had an opportunity to extol New Mexico at the Panama, California exposition that was to, due to open in San Diego in 1915. So they were desperate to find out what was Santa Fe style, and they really hadn't settled on that. They knew what it wasn't. They didn't want it to be California mission, 
but they didn't know what it was. And um, I told you earlier that Vieira was sent out to photograph all of the existing Franciscan missions. So he went out to do that, and Morley was involved in setting up an exposition uh, here in Santa Fe to convince people that they really needed to, uh, to preserve these buildings and how they could go about doing that. And then at the same time, they needed to figure out how to build a New Mexico building for this Panama, California exposition. So this is like a three-pronged craziness that's going on, and all these guys are working like crazy people. And meanwhile, uh, Morley is publishing his book on Mayan hieroglyphics. I mean, I don't know how they had the time to, all, to do all this, but they did. And I, I want to quote to you a, a, a letter that Morley wrote to Mr. Rapp. Dear Mr. Rapp, quite by accident there has fallen into my hands a picture of the Colorado supply store at Morley, Colorado, designed by you. The thing is so absolutely in the spirit of the Santa Fe style that I am taking the liberty of asking you to allow us to exhibit the original drawings, maps, elevations, and so forth at our um, ex upcoming ex exhibi exhibition. This is the exhibition that they're going to do in in 1913. And uh, also you see up there a quote from Morley about how that building got built. It was really the president of this Colorado supply company, uh, Shank, who asked Rapp, who would do anything that anybody asked him to do, uh, to build a building that looked like Akama. And Shazam, it was like the thing that kind of lit Morley up. This is, a, is the as-built of, um, of that beautiful rendering, that beautiful watercolor rendering. And this was de designed by Rapp and Rapp in 1908. And um, as Morley says, it was the first attempt to adapt Santa Fe architecture to modern building requirements and also one of the most successful. So Morley got very excited. It was his eureka moment. And they said, this is the building we're going to do. And they had the, oh, they also had uh, this um, exhibition here to show people how they could build in this new Santa Fe style. Uh, to quote Morley, to stimulate local interest in the native architecture of the Santa Fe Chamber of Commerce in the fall of 1913, organized at the writer's suggestion an architectural contest prizes being offered for the best design of the Santa Fe style residence, residence not to exceed $3,500 in cost. 65 designs were submitted in all and many new and happy ideas were brought to light. This house was awarded second prize. Um, and you notice something that, you know, you architectural buffs will notice that it's in a territorial style. So as, as early as 1913, uh, Carlos Vieira, who won the second prize, was using these brick cornices and different roof levels and, and um, building in this, what we now call the uh, territorial style. I want to um, share with you um, what Carlos Vieira saw when he went to these uh, existing Franciscan missions, and also he went everywhere, not just to uh, the Pueblos, but also to other villages, and we saw that one photograph taken right here in Santa Fe. And he collected all of these um, photographs in six albums, which are now at the uh, John Gall Meme Collection at the Center for Southwest Research. And um, it's a great treat to be able to go through these albums and to directly see what it was that was inspiring Vieira and Morley in their attempt to come up with the solution of what Santa Fe style should be for this community. So it's sort of an old art historian trick that you, you, you put together uh, 
the original documents, and in this case, of course, we're very lucky because it was only 100 years ago and we have the original documents, people telling us what they were thinking, what, what their process was. And in this case, we also have um, these wonderful photographs and drawings, which are also original documents. And we put those together and we can sense what was really important to people at that time. And um, I, I throw in here John Gall Means' uh, influence because, of course, it's enormous uh, as, as New Mexico's premier 20th century architect. Um, and he had access. He was given these, um, these six albums, uh, and they eventually ended up in, in, uh, at UNM. So he, Vieira, Carlos Vieira, served as his mentor. At, with these six albums. And um, elsewhere, it says that Meme designed some 40 buildings on the campus, so a lot of buildings. And you see here uh, the tower at Akama. This is after restoration by Meme. Now, Carlos Vieira, besides running around taking all these photographs and helping on this board and submitting his architectural uh, designs uh, was also, he was a painter and he uh, in fact was the painter of the murals or the paintings, these aren't actually murals, they're paintings that you see on the walls here. They were designed by Donald Beauregard who did not live to execute them but they were executed by Vieira and by uh, Kenneth Chapman. And in fact, if you look in the corner there, in that corner over there, uh, the, the figure of Columbus is supposedly a self-portrait by Vieira. And he was also madly working away to do all these paintings for the exposition at, um, in, in San Diego. And they are, some of them are still there. Uh, he did, at the, he exhibited there 14 oil paintings and numerous watercolors of Santa Fe architecture. And Morley was busy as well. He uh, took it upon himself to restore a 18th century structure home, the Roque Lovato home, and he, to quote him, finally the adapt adaptation of the style to modern living requirements has been accomplished without sacrificing its, extential, its essential exterior characteristics and the interior changes and modifications introduced have been made chiefly in the direction of the 20th, of 20th century comfort, such as replacing earth floors with wood floors, good idea, earth roofs with composition or tin roofs, mica or paper window panes with glass, and no plumbing at all with sanitary plumbing. So we have to understand what was, this, what was Santa Fe in 1912 to 1915? It was a wreck. I mean, it had no infrastructure to speak of, uh, barely any uh, sewer systems, no paved roads. Um, the house I showed you, well, even this house, the Roque Lovato house before it was repaired, um, th there were lots of properties like that in Santa Fe. It was, um, it was really in danger of, of becoming a total backwater, and that was what inspired this 1912 uh, planning group. Um, Morley went on, in, in his words, um, to define some of the elements that all of these buildings should contain. Uh, his, he had a whole list of things. Number five is carved wood members are extensively and effectively used in facade decoration. Perhaps the most characteristic Characteristic development in this direction is the so-called Santa Fe Capital. Well, he did define Santa Fe style, but Santa Fe Capital never caught on. Um, it's what we would call corbels today. And you see these renderings of different uh, corbels that he uh, put in that 1915 document. And then you see the ones you can order up today. I think the old church is very close to number four there. So when who is Althea, we don't know. 
and more on the wood members. 50 years ago, doubtless, examples of this fine old native art were fairly common, but most of them unfortunately disappeared before the dis devastating wave of commonplace modernism, which overwhelmed artistic expression in New Mexico after the American occupation. That's Morley we're quoting again. So, in 1915, the exposition gets underway in San Diego. There you see the guidebook and this really cool set of exposition China. It was for sale on eBay. Um, <laughs> and Twitchell um, promoted the idea that the New Mexico exhibit at the Panama, California exhibition of 1915 should not be a glorified pumpkin show it should feature the historical traditions of New Mexico. So we have Twitchell to thank for the fact that that building did get built. Now meanwhile in San Diego, they were having their own problems deciding what their identity was and um, they had two things to choose from. They had what we call mission style or mission revival and there's an example of, of the um, train station in Santa Barbara and then uh, the other building, that very elaborate um, frou-frou building, which is in the Spanish colonial revival style, was the style that won for the exposition, which is kind of bizarre because it's, who can duplicate that? I mean, it's, and, and frankly, who would want to duplicate that? <laughs> And other things that happened, uh, Colonel Collier, who was running the show, uh, thought that they should build a Pueblo, which they did. And uh, to quote him, colonists, be, meaning people who move into a city, colonists and investors follow the tourist. So you gotta get those tourists in here. And, and he suggested that Santa Fe have their own exposition, of course, San Diego, they were in competition with San Francisco. So while we're in competition with California, San Diego's in competition with San Francisco to get the, uh, the recognition they felt they deserved because they were also afraid of kind of slipping away. So this is the as-built, uh, or, or a rendering of the as-built New Mexican building in San Diego. And you see it bears a shocking resemblance to the building we're in. Uh, the agaves parked out front are kind of a dead giveaway that we aren't in Santa Fe. But otherwise, it looks kind of familiar. And then this is our work of art. Uh, the people who have worked in this building all agree that the greatest work of art in this building is this building. And. Um, and to quote David Rausch, what the museum really does is define new Santa Fe style. So this, is, this becomes the iconic image. And this is what they were looking at in 1910, 1912, in order to define this building. It's a mission building in the Pueblo of Acoma. To quote uh, Vieira, in its primitive state, it is in some ways inadequate, but it is capable of such development as to suit every modern purpose. Only within very recent years has it been considered and given the study which it merits. We find the, excuse me, we find the community type represented as well as the domestic and ecclesiastical. So what they're looking at is a, um, is a 17th century Franciscan mission style building put into a Pueblo. And as uh, Beverly Spears mentions in her book on 16th century Mexican churches, the elements are part of the European monastic formula. And these types of buildings were in the 16th century were being built all over Mexico and here you see the ex-convento at Santo Domingo in Oaxaca. Don't be confused by these two words, convento and monastic. Um, these buildings were not cloistered kinds of places. They were administrative hubs. They were the power centers of these communities. 
especially true in Oaxaca, you see the enormous scale of this building, uh, the enormous resources that were poured into uh, these, these buildings, and they were not meant for nuns, they were men who ran this enterprise. To quote Vieira again, if there was anything of stiffness or formality about these missions when they left the hand of the builder, the greatest harmonizing influence of all, the work of nature, brought about the final unity. So what's he saying there? He's saying that this falling apart building is the final unity, um, that all of the top elements of this building are melting away. You see that in those funny little nubs on the top of the building. And these funny little nubs kind of get incorporated into Pueblo Revival architecture. Because what they were seeing were buildings that were falling apart. It was, it was perhaps this gradual change through erosion and repair that brought the most interesting exterior character. This is Vieira again. Remember, he was an artist. In fact, this architecture is hardly to be considered a finished product until this freeing of exterior form and outline has taken place. To further quote, it is in reality a freehand architecture with the living quality of a sculptor's work. And that's what we prize today, that living quality, that, um, you know, don't give me any hard edges, please. And it's hard to know how these individual elements of these uh, eroding buildings, such as this oval uh, opening at, in Chimayo, got transferred in the drawings uh, and from there into the future. The, the window is in a little stam home in the Solana area, Santa Fe. Oh, it's kind of hard to see these, I know, because they're 100-year-old drawings uh, that have been photographed. But take a look at the window shapes, the chimney pots, the eroded top towers, and uh, the shape of the openings of the towers. So kind of put those into your mind, those little details. And I want you to also know that uh, as Vieira went around, he focused not just on these ecclesiastical structures, but also on other building types. And the romantic erosion continued, um, and probably continues to this day. Here you see Jean Kloss's uh, representation of Trompas in the 30s, and it, it's missing its towers in the 30s. So Vieira goes on to tell us exactly what he is seeing in his photographs and where they get uh, placed. So the Laguna Mission, and you'll have to go outside later and check this out, the Laguna Mission suggests the east front of the new museum. So east front. You see the little nubbies up there and the bells. And here is a beautiful watercolor by Kenneth Chapman uh, of what they thought the east side was going to look like. And you, you can see in this watercolor the chimney pots, the little um, spiky little nubs there on that east front, and the nice hollyhocks. Now, this is even harder to see. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it, it's showing that east front down there on the bottom with the, um, I think the chimney pots are in place. And then he, uh, Viar goes on to say, uh, a half porch at Cochiti suggests like features in the New Mexico Museum. So if you look on the east side especially, you'll see these uh, stepped walls and these half porches. There is no architecture presenting such a variety in arrangements as is to be found in some of our Indian pueblos of from two to four stories in height. And here we have Vieira repeating himself, from the domestic it merges beautifully into the ecclesiastic, and the combination of the two has been charmingly expressed in recent construction. He's talking about this building. 
Through this combination will perhaps come the greatest adaptability to civic purposes. So they're trying to um, position these buildings to adapt to public life, not ecclesiastical life, not life in the Pueblo, but civic life in our city. Here you get a view of the what becomes sort of a, a campus complex of the Museum of Art, the Hewitt House, and the Palace of the Governors. And you see that odd window uh, at the end of the Palace of the Governors of the newly renovated portal. Um, I'm going to show you a relation. I've always looked at that, and I thought it looked like a pass-through in a 1970s kitchen. You know, what is it doing there? What relationship does it have to uh, architecture in New Mexico? And then I, kind of, I figured it out by looking through the, um, the albums that, in fact, that uh, if you look at Laguna, there, uh, there's an older photograph of the complete church. And you see it's to the side, the, the, the area that w would have housed the priest is called the Porteria, Porteria. And it's being kind of filled in, and it's making this odd-shaped window. And then a little bit later, they really fill it in, and they stucco it. And I think that becomes that window element at the end of the, pal uh, the portal of the Palace of the Governors. Again, to quote Vieira, through the work of the Franciscans who in our earliest history established their missions among our Indian communities, we have an extension from the original single dwelling and community type, so we're talking about Pueblo, real Pueblo architecture, into the larger portions of the ecclesiastic bringing it into closer relations to Spanish architecture. So basically what we're seeing in these buildings, um, though they were built in the Pueblos, they're Spanish buildings. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you. How do these murals in this auditorium, or these paintings, fit into the entire building's relationship to the missions in the Pueblo. So they're going around to visiting all of the Pueblos, um, and one assumes they're going into the buildings as well. Um, I think the, the subject matter um, here, to me, these paintings remind me of a little bit like N.C. Wyeth. You know, they're like boys' adventure illustrations for books. Um, they they're kind of churchy looking because of the arches, but um, they're also, you know, what relationship do they have to New Mexico? What about the interior here, guys? They were walking into places like Laguna that had a complete altar screen at that time from the 18th century. Here it's been kind of cleaned up and repainted, but, but then there was other kinds of wall paintings that were in the churches None of that gets transferred to this building. Nor do two other important aspects of religious art get transferred to these buildings. The paintings on Hyde, which were done in probably the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, by probably, or at least heavily influenced by the priests of the church, as well as our really important uh, 18th and 19th century religious art of the New Mexican Santos. It's nowhere to be seen in this building or any of the other revival style buildings that were being done at that time. Some things did get here uh, in, in, in the way of furniture. If you notice this piece of furniture that I'm standing behind, it was made for Dr. Springer, and uh, he was taller than I am. <laughs> and you see this Solomonic column effect that is on this pulpit from Trompas. And also, they were, uh, Vieira was looking at fireplaces. This is important, because he's looking at other aspects of architecture besides just the facades. And then they had to furnish these buildings at the same time, too. And Jess Nussbaum took that on. Uh, he, he also took on all these beautiful, uh, this chip carved decoration and painting. 
And you see, here's a piece of original furniture that's still in the building. And then there was another artist uh, named Sam Huddleston, or a, a, he was more of a carpenter, contractor type person, and he is credited with doing this little desk, which I rescued personally out of the old administration building uh, and brought it back over here, and I cannot begin to tell you how much gum was stuck underneath this. <laughs> really disgusting. Uh, and the design on this is really complex. I think that's probably uh, some of Kenneth Chapman's drawings that are being translated, in, because Kenneth Chapman was really very important in the um, salvation of Pueblo pottery and its designs. And then there are a couple of flyers that kind of happened. Um, uh, Trent Thomas and Carlos Vieira used a, as their basic source, a book entitled Old Oak Furniture by Fred Rowe. It was published in London and Chicago in 1907. And they just took this style of, of old oak furniture and translated it into a New Mexico kind of furniture through painting and, and uh, and carving. And another important thing that we cannot forget that's going on at the same time is people are developing their own homes and their own style and they're getting excited about having a Santa Fe home. And this wonderful picture of Victor Higgins and his young wife, Sarah Parsons Higgins, you know, the idea, we're going to build a house around this Pueblo pot. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, it's just <laughs> wonderful that they had that young energy. And in fact, that's what happened. That's why we're in the homes we're in to, today, because of uh, people like the Higgins and the Parsons. Um, Carlos Vieira was looking at a lot of different things, like chimney pots and ornos on the roof. Who knew they were on the roof? And then I just had to share this. It has no relationship to anything but the fact that um, I think that one child on the ladder has got to be all of four years old. Um, this is how you teach children to be um, confident. <laughs> <laughs> you let them climb up ladders and put Pueblo pots on their heads, and they learn how to do it that way. So he was, Vieira was looking at all kinds of things, and he was also instrumental in the creation of domestic architecture, um, making a modern style, Santa Fe style home. And so with Trent Thomas, who was an architect who worked with Rap and Rap, uh, he worked in developing his home, the Carlos Vera house, that's on the old Pecos Trail that you, you can now, you can hardly see it because there's so many trees around it, which is really unfortunate. Uh, but it gives you a sense of what the old Pecos Trail looked like in, in 1918. It was, there was, no vegetation out there to speak of. Um, and then to quote uh, Paul Walter at, at Vieira's death, that Santa Fe is not only a city different, but also a city beautiful, is more largely owing to him, perhaps, than to any other one individual. And also in the albums, I loved this part. It, there just wasn't enough of it for me. Uh, and I could add a few pages to this album on that architecture. Um, but you, you can see Carlos Vieira really didn't like those little things coming up in the corner at all. He didn't, he didn't dig that. And the, uh, the wonderful, must be a float for the, uh, one of the fiestas the house different, and he's kind of th <laughs> thrown everything into the pot there. <laughs> and included in the bad architecture, I want you to know, is the Mabel Dodge Lujan house in Taos. So if it's not in Santa Fe, yeah. <laughs> uh, by the 30s, it was nailed down. Everybody at the university accepted Santa Fe style architecture. Everybody in Santa Fe accepted it. Um, it was another decade or two before it became written into law. 
Um, but here you see the president's house when it was first built, and here you see it today. Um, Dave and I stopped by there and took this picture on the day we went to look at the albums at the, um, at the university. Now I just want you to know that they didn't get it all right all the time. There were a lot of missteps. And uh, I'm going to quote to you from Bay Morley. Um, he talks about the complete elimination of the Roman arch. And then he's, per he's suggesting this craziness arch for the, um, for the plaza that fortunately, I will quote myself, Fortunately, this hideous behemoth, shaped like the facade of the Alamo with a big cross perched on top, was never constructed. That Vay Morley was so opposed to the use of blue window trim, but championed this clunky arch, just goes to show you that no single person should be the style police. <laughs> the identity of a community belongs to the entire community which means Santa Feans must guard their past and their style by fighting it out in the public forum, one light fixture and one streetscape at a time. Thank you very much. <laughs>